In ancient Egyptian history, the Old Kingdom is the period spanning c. 2700-2200 BC. It is also known as the Age of the Pyramids or the Age of the Pyramid Builders as it encompasses the reigns of the great pyramid builders of the 4th dynasty such as King Sneferu who perfected the art of pyramid building and the kings Khufu, Khafre and Menkori who constructed the pyramids at Giza. Egypt attained its first sustained peak of civilization during the Old Kingdom the first of three so-called kingdom periods followed by the Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom which mark the high points of civilization in the Lower Nile Valley. The Old Kingdom is most commonly regarded as the period from the 3rd dynasty to the 6th dynasty 2686-2181 BC. Information from the 4th to the 6th dynasties of Egypt is scarce and historians regard the history of the era as literally written in stone and largely architectural in that it is through the monuments and their inscriptions that scholars have been able to construct the history. Egyptologists also include the Memphite 7th and 8th dynasties in the Old Kingdom as a continuation of the administration, centralized at Memphis. While the Old Kingdom was a period of internal security and prosperity, it was followed by a period of disunity and relative cultural decline referred to by Egyptologists as the First Intermediate Period. During the Old Kingdom, the king of Egypt, not called the pharaoh until the New Kingdom, became a living god who ruled absolutely and could demand the services and wealth of his subjects. The concept of an Old Kingdom, as one of three Golden Ages, was coined in 1845 by the German Egyptologist Baron von Bunsen, and its definition would evolve significantly throughout the 19th and the 20th centuries. Not only was the last king of the early dynastic period related to the first two kings of the Old Kingdom, but the capital, the royal residence, remained at Inhej, the ancient Egyptian name for Memphis. The basic justification for a separation between the two periods is the revolutionary change in architecture accompanied by the effects on Egyptian society and the economy of large-scale building projects. Under King Djoser, the first king of the third dynasty of the Old Kingdom, the royal capital of Egypt was moved to Memphis, where Djosa established his court. A new era of building was initiated at Saqqara under his reign. King Djosa's architect, Imhotep, is credited with the development of building with stone and with the conception of the new architectural form, the Step Pyramid. The Old Kingdom is perhaps best known for a large number of pyramids constructed at this time as burial places for Egypt's kings. Frontality, the first principle, indicates that art was viewed directly from the front. One was meant to approach a piece as they would a living individual, for it was meant to be a place of manifestation. The act of interaction would bring forth the divine entity represented in the art. It was therefore imperative that whoever was represented be as identifiable as possible. The guidelines developed in the Old Kingdom and the later grid system developed in the Middle Kingdom ensured that art was axial, symmetrical, proportional, and most importantly reproducible and therefore recognizable. Composite composition, the second principle, also contributes to the goal of identification. Multiple perspectives were used in order to ensure that the onlooker could determine precisely what they saw. Though Egyptian art almost always includes descriptive text, literacy rates were not high, so the art gave another method for communicating the same information. One of the best examples of composite composition is the human form. In most two-dimensional relief, the head, legs, and feet are seen in profile, while the torso faces directly front. Another common example is an aerial view of a building or location. The third principle, the hierarchy of scale, illustrates relative importance in society. The larger the figure, the more important the individual. The king is usually the largest, aside from deities. The similarity in size equated to similarity in position. However, this is not to say that physical differences weren't shown as well. Women, for example, are usually shown as smaller than men. Children retain adult features and proportions but are substantially smaller in size. The most defining feature of ancient Egyptian art is its function, as that was the entire purpose of creation. Art was not made for enjoyment in the strictest sense, but rather served a role of some kind in Egyptian religion and ideology. 
This fact manifests itself in the artistic style, even as it evolved over the dynasties. The three primary principles of that style, frontality, composite composition, and hierarchy scale, illustrate this quite well. These characteristics, initiated in the early dynastic period and solidified during the Old Kingdom, persisted with some adaptability throughout the entirety of ancient Egyptian history as the foundation of its art. Aside from the three primary conventions, there are several characteristics that can help date a piece to a particular time frame. Proportions of the human figure are one of the most distinctive, as they vary between kingdoms. Old Kingdom male figures have characteristically broad shoulders and a long torso, with obvious musculature. On the other hand, females are narrower in the shoulders and waist, with longer legs and a shorter torso. However, in the 6th dynasty, the male figures lose their muscularity and their shoulders narrow. The eyes also tend to get much larger. In order to help maintain the consistency of these proportions, the Egyptians used a series of eight guidelines to divide the body. They occurred at the following locations, the top of the head, the hairline, the base of the neck, the underarms, the tip of the elbow or the bottom of the ribcage, the top of the thigh at the bottom of the buttocks, the knee, and the middle of the lower leg. From the soles of the feet to the hairline was also divided into thirds, one third between the soles and the knee, another third between the knee and the elbow, and the final third from the elbow to the hairline. The broad shoulders that appeared in the 5th dynasty constituted roughly that one third length as well. These proportions not only help with the identification of representations and the reproduction of art but also tie into the Egyptian ideal of order, which tied into the solar aspect of their religion and the inundations of the Nile. The sculpture was a major product of the Old Kingdom. The position of the figures in this period was mostly limited to sitting or standing, either with feet together or in the striding pose. Group statues of the king with either gods or family members, typically his wife and children, were also common. It was not just the subject of sculpture that was important, but also the material, the use of hard stone, such as gneiss, bravac, schist, and granite, was relatively common in the Old Kingdom. The color of the stone had a great deal of symbolism and was chosen deliberately. Four colors were distinguished in the ancient Egyptian language, black, green, red, and white. Black was associated with Egypt due to the color of the soil after the Nile flood, green with vegetation and rebirth, red with the sun and its regenerative cycle, and white with purity. The statue of Menkori with Hathor and Input is an example of a typical Old Kingdom sculpture. The three figures display frontality and axiality, while fitting with the proportions of this time period. The Gravak came from the eastern desert in Egypt and is therefore associated with rebirth and the rising of the sun in the east. Though the above concepts apply to most, if not all, figures in Egyptian art, there are additional characteristics that apply to the representations of the king. Their appearance was not an exact rendering of the king's visage, though kings are somewhat identifiable through looks alone. Identification could be supplied by inscriptions or context. A huge, more important part of a king's portrayal was about the idea of the office of kingship, which were dependent on the time period. The Old Kingdom was considered a golden age for Egypt, a grandiose height to which all future kingdoms aspired. As such, the king was portrayed as young vital, with features that agreed with the standards of beauty of the time. The musculature seen in male figures was also applied to kings. A royal right, the jubilee run which was established during the Old Kingdom, involved the king running around a group of markers that symbolized the geographic borders of Egypt. This was meant to be a demonstration of the king's physical vigor, which determined his capacity to continue his reign. This idea of kingly youth and strength were pervasive in the Old Kingdom and thus shown in the art. End of a dynasty nothing prepared Egypt for the eclipse of royal power and poverty that came after Pepi II. Nothing prepared Egypt for the eclipse of royal power and poverty that came after Pepi II Neferkare. He had ruled for more than 90 years 2246-2152 B.C. as the fourth king of the sixth dynasty of the Old Kingdom.
Within the span of 20 years, fragmentary records indicate that no less than 18 kings and possibly one queen ascended the throne with nominal control over the country. This was the entire length of the 7th and 8th dynasties 2150-2134 BC. In the last few years of the 6th dynasty, the erosion of power of the centralized state was offset by that of provincial governors and officials who became hereditary holders of their posts and treated their regions as their own property. Egypt, to be sure, survived the disastrous collapse of the monarchy. Within a century, Egyptians had reinvented centralized government. They refurbished the image of kings so that they were not merely rulers by virtue of their divine descent but more importantly had to uphold order and justice, care for the dispossessed and show mercy and compassion. The crisis that shook Egyptian society thus heralded the most dramatic transformation in the royal institution, which was destined never to be separated from the social function. The crisis not only reformed the monarchy but also instilled the spirit of social justice and laid the foundation for mercy and compassion as fundamental virtues. It was these concepts that were later to infuse Christianity and Islam. It was these same concepts that eventually led to the overthrowing of monarchs who repeatedly usurped their powers and denied people their religious rights. What was the factor that weakened the monarchy and allowed provincial governors to assume royal power over their regions? One possibility is an invasion by Asiatics. However, there is no evidence that Asiatics invaded Egypt at the end of the Old Kingdom. Alternatively, the initial breakdown of the Old Kingdom was caused by a sudden, unanticipated, catastrophic reduction in the Nile floods over two or three decades. This was so severe that famine gripped the country and paralyzed the political institutions. People were forced to commit unheard of atrocities such as eating their own children and violating the sacred sanctity of the royal dead. The Egyptian sage Ipua gives a graphic description of the horrendous events of that time. Fragmented rule, even imbeciles and children could rule with no threat to the royal institution. Some Egyptologists attribute the sudden collapse of the Old Kingdom to the long reign of Pepi II. However, a reign which lasted for more than 90 years suggests, if anything, stability and strength. Even if the collapse was due to Pepi II's long reign, the struggle for power among the sons of Pepi II at the end of his rule is not a reason for the dissolution of the monarchy. Moreover, it is misleading to speak of his successes as being weak kings without giving any reasons as to how such divine rulers of absolute power could have become so. Under such conditions, even embassies and children could rule with no threat to the royal institution. Historically, this has always been the case because kingship is less about the king in person than the institution whose beneficiaries, the royal court, nobles, regional governors and priests, gain from its presence. They suffer to lose everything if the intuition is compromised or handed over to another royal personage. For this reason, the principle of divine kingship was maintained even when the king was replaced by rulers drawn from outside the family of the enthroned king. We have no indication at the end of the sixth dynasty that there was a bid for power by the local governors. It is only after the initial breakdown that power was wielded by the kings of a province in Middle Egypt, later called Heracleopolis. The capital was approximately 15 kilometers west of Beni Suf on the right bank of Bahar Yusuf. According to Manetho, Heracleopolis became the capital of Egypt during the 9th and 10th dynasties and the town played a major role after the end of the Old Kingdom. Evidence for this account comes from inscriptions in the tombs of a vassal prince at Issue. These reveal that war broke out between the kings of Heracleopolis and Theban kings. The war lasted for several years and ended when the Theban king Mentuhotep II Nebhipatric 2061-2010 B.C. defeated Heracleopolis before reunifying the country. Contrary to what some Egyptologists claim, the stability of the long reign of Pepi II was most likely due to the decentralization of the government. This is one of the most successful strategies in managing complex organizations. The ambitions of local governors in such a system are primarily curtailed by the economic and defense rewards of being a vassal. In addition, there is the strong likelihood of failure in staging an uprising because the king can count on many more loyalists. Only when the monarchy is undermined by some unforeseen cause, would charismatic and ambitious provincial governors seek to become kings. 
in this situation, they stand to gain from restoring the monarchy in their name, thus counting on the support of others who, in the absence of a powerful king, would rally behind them. Lo, the desert claims the land towns are ravaged, Upper Egypt became a wasteland low, everyone's hair has fallen out low, great and small say, I wish I were dead, lo, children of nobles are dashed against walls, infants are put on high ground, food is lacking, wearers of fine linen are beaten with sticks, ladies suffer like maidservants, lo, those who were entombed are cast on high grounds, men stir up strife unopposed, groaning is throughout the land, mingled with laments, see now the land deprived of kingship or the pyramid hid is empty, the people are diminished. Egyptologists concede that there can be no doubt that these texts relate to fact. There is incontrovertible evidence that this terrible famine was caused by the reduction of the Nile floods. The scale of the failure of the floods is shown by the fact that the Fayyan, a lake of some 65 meters deep, dried up. This means that the lake actually evaporated over time. These low floods were related to global climatic cooling which reduced the amount of rainfall in Ethiopia and East Africa. In Iceland, researchers have detected a transition from birch and grassland vegetation to Arctic conditions in about 2150 BC. This correlates with a shift to drier climate in southeastern Europe c.2200-2100 BC. Also, the reappearance of oak at white moss, UK, suggests fluctuating wetness in around 2190-1891 BC. In Italy, drier conditions are found around 2200-1900 BC in Lake Castellian. Dry spells have also been detected as far away as western Tibet at Lake Sumshi. Dot, dot, dot. The Nile can be considered as the force which destroyed the civilization that it had nurtured. The most tantalizing recent discovery, however, was made when scientists made a high-resolution study of dust deposition from Kajemaram Oasis in northeastern Nigeria. The study conclusively revealed that a pronounced shift in atmospheric circulation occurred in around 2150 BC. This data indicates that an abrupt, short-lived event of cold climate led to less rainfall and a reduction of water flow in a vast area extending from Tibet to Italy. This had catastrophic effects on such early state societies as the Egyptian Old Kingdom. Long-term variations in Nile floods are beyond the perceptions of people. The Nile, today and during the prosperous times of the Old Kingdom, is regarded unquestionably as the source of life in Egypt. Therefore, the Nile can be considered as the force which destroyed the civilization that it had nurtured. Inconceivable as it might be, the Nile is a temperamental river. The volume of flood discharge varies wildly in episodes which range from decades to hundreds of years. Furthermore, there is the impact of freak years where the floods can be disastrously low or high. The impact of a series of low floods, even if they occur over a few years, can cause distress, famine, plague and civil unrest in Egypt. For example, in AD 967, a low flood caused a severe famine that left 600,000 people dead in and around Fustat, the then capital of Egypt. The famine lasted for two years and it was not until AD 971-2 that plentiful harvests returned. Once again, in 1201, low Nile floods followed by another low flood in 1202 caused a catastrophic famine. This eyewitness account comes from Abdel Latif al-Baghdadi, a physician scholar from Baghdad who was in Egypt from 1194 to AD 1200. He reported that people emigrated in crowds and that those who remained habitually ate human flesh, parents even ate their own children. Graves were ransacked for food, assassinations and robbery reigned unchecked and noble women implored to be bought as slaves. Al-Baghdadi's account is almost an exact copy of that recorded by Anktafai, more than 3,000 years earlier. All Upper Egypt was dying of hunger, to such an extent that everyone has come to eating his children. The entire country had become starved like a starved grasshopper, with people going to the north and to the south, in search of grain. Al-Baghdadi, a physician scholar from Baghdad, the low Nile episode that devastated the Old Kingdom was, however, of greater magnitude and duration than that of 967 or AD 1201. Return to power It was the Heracleopolitan kings from Bahar Yusuf who restored order and stability as the Nile floods allowed the return of plentiful harvests. 
This was perhaps after 20 to 30 years of low floods. In the meantime, the Theban rulers began to position themselves to appropriate and resurrect the tattered monarchy. They were on a collision course with the Heracleopolitan kings who, as texts reveal, lost to their southern rivals. However, the Heracleopolitan legacy of that period which emphasized notions of justice, mercy, and social services were never extinguished. Some of the treatises detailing these notions became Egyptian classics. They include the instructions attributed to Heracleopolitan King Katie to his son Merikare. In these instructions, the king stressed the social obligations of the king and advised the heir to the throne to remember that God created godly rulers to fortify the backbones of the weak and counteract the blows of fate. Within the context of the Heracleopolitan society of the early 12th dynasty, the tale of the eloquent peasant was certainly disseminated as a piece of official wisdom. It is clearly a bill of rights of ordinary citizens and the responsibility of state officials towards the poor and powerless. The tale regards the ruler as a father to the orphan, husband to the widow, brother to she who is divorced, a garment to the motherless, a just ruler who comes to the voice of those who call him. The end of the old kingdom was not the end of Egyptian civilization. There are four successive episodes during this upheaval of Egyptian civilization. First came the initial episode of shock, upheaval and fragmentation which were caused by low floods. This lasted from the end of the 6th dynasty to the end of the 8th perhaps as early as 2100 and certainly by 2155-2134 BC. Then came the second episode of rehabilitation and redevelopment of regional polities which commenced c. 2134 BC. This encompassed the first two generations after the end of the 8th dynasty, the 9th in Heracleopolis, and the first part of the 10th in Thebes. This was followed by the struggle between Thebes and Heracleopolis during the reign of Antephi who succeeded in re-establishing order during his 50-year reign. This incidentally did not lead to any weak successes. Finally occurred the consolidation of national unity by Mentuhotepe II and his immediate successes after c. 2020 BC. The end of the Old Kingdom was not the end of Egyptian civilization. The so-called, first intermediate, period was not a dark age. The calamity triggered by low Nile floods was the impetus to radical social changes and a reformulation of the notion of kingship. The legacy of this period is still with us today. Egyptians were the first to work in stone on a massive scale. These photos trace their development from the first stone, city, at Saqqara to the Great Pyramids at Giza, which remained the tallest structures in the world until the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889. The structures shown were built during the Old Kingdom, in the 3rd through the 5th dynasties, c. 2667-2345 BCE. During this remarkable period of 300 years, the Egyptians learned by trial and error to create the massive structures that remain to this day. For example, at Saqqara, early architects creating stone columns for the first time were uncertain of their strength and so buttressed them for stability. The classic pyramid form that is so familiar today began as a series of mastabas, raised platforms, built one atop another in a stair-step fashion, eventually leading to the step pyramid of the pharaoh Zosa, Zosa, the world's first pyramid. The bent pyramid was another failed experiment along the path to the final form perfected at last with the red pyramid and then taken to a grand scale with the magnificent pyramids on the Giza plateau. Despite these successes, the art of pyramid building or the will to build such grand structures was soon lost. The photos also show the great sphinx at Giza, believed to have been built by Chafrin, also known as Khafre, 4th dynasty 2558-2532 BCE. The Sphinx remains one of the most enigmatic sculptures in the world. Not all of the Old Kingdom's great works were built in stone. Buried next to the Great Pyramid of Cheops Khufu, 4th Dynasty, 2589-2566 BCE, at Giza, archaeologists found a large, well-preserved wooden boat, dubbed the Solar Boat, that was presumably intended for the pharaoh's use in the afterlife. This remarkable vessel is today preserved in a separate building at Giza and is well worth seeing.
the old kingdom of Egypt existed from the 3rd through the 6th dynasties 2686 BC 2182 BC. A period of political stability and economic prosperity, it is characterized by revolutionary advancements in royal funerary architecture. Both Egyptian society and the economy were greatly impacted by the organization of major state-sponsored building projects, which focused on building tombs for their kings. These tombs were built in the form of great pyramids, and for this reason, the Old Kingdom is frequently referred to as the Age of the Pyramids. Evolution of the Mastaba During the Old Kingdom, royal Mastabas eventually developed into rock-cut, step pyramids, and then, true pyramids, although non-royal use of Mastabas continued to be used for more than a thousand years. As the pyramids were constructed for the kings, Mastabas for lesser royals were constructed around them. The interior walls of the tombs were decorated with scenes of daily life and funerary rituals. Because of the riches included in graves, tombs were a tempting site for grave robbers. The increasing size of the pyramids is in part credited to protecting the valuables within, and many other tombs were built into rock cliffs in an attempt to thwart grave robbers. Joseph's Step Pyramid The first king to launch a major pyramid building project was King Joseph, who ruled in the Third Dynasty. He built his famous, Step Pyramid, at Saqqara, not far from the capital city of Memphis near modern-day Cairo. In the following dynasties, the pyramid design changed from the, Step, Pyramid to a true pyramid shape as kings continued to build tombs for their kings. Among these, the pyramids of Giza are considered the greatest architectural achievement of the time. The pyramids of Giza The pyramids of Giza, also known as the Giza Necropolis, are one of the oldest remaining wonders of the world. The necropolis includes three pyramid complexes, the Great Pyramid built by King Khufu of the 4th dynasty, the somewhat smaller pyramid of Khafrut but by Khufu's son, and the relatively modest-sized pyramid of Menkori. The necropolis also includes several cemeteries, a worker's village, an industrial complex, and a massive sculpture known as the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx is a limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a lion's body and a human head. It is commonly believed that the head is that of King Khafre, who ruled during the 4th dynasty. It is the largest monolith statue in the world, standing 241 feet long, 63 feet wide, and 66.34 feet high. We still do not know exactly how the huge and impressive stone monuments were built. Most of the stone for the interior seems to have been quarried immediately to the south of the construction site. The smooth exterior of the pyramid, however, was made of a fine grade of white limestone that was quarried from the other side of the Nile River. These exterior blocks had to be carefully cut, transported by river barge to Giza, and dragged up ramps to the construction site. Theorists disagree as to the method by which the stones were then put into place and how possible the method was. It's also possible that the architects developed their techniques over time. The sides of all three of the Giza pyramids were astronomically oriented to the north, south and east, west within a small fraction of a degree. To ensure that the pyramid remained symmetrical, the exterior casing stones all had to be equal in height and width. Workers might have marked all the blocks to indicate the angle of the pyramid wall and trimmed the surfaces carefully so that the blocks fit together. The work of quarrying, moving, setting, and sculpting the huge amount of stone used to build the pyramids might have been accomplished by several thousand skilled workers and unskilled laborers. Evidence from the tombs indicates that a workforce of 10,000 laborers working in three-month shifts took around 30 years to build a single pyramid. Mummification and burial ritual in order to preserve the body and, therefore, the soul of the deceased, Egyptians used the process of mummification. This involved removing the internal organs, wrapping the body in linen, and burying the mummy in a rectangular stone sarcophagus or wooden coffin. Because it was believed that the deceased would continue his or her earthly life in the afterlife, accommodations were made to ensure this transition. The opening of the mouth ceremony was a ritual involving the symbolic animation of a mummy by magically opening its mouth so that it could breathe, speak, eat, and drink in the afterlife. Many mummies were provided with some form of funerary literature, 
often consisting of spells and instructions for navigating the afterlife. During the Old Kingdom, only the pharaoh had access to this material, which scholars refer to as the pyramid texts. The pyramid texts are a collection of spells to assure the royal resurrection and protect the pharaoh from various malignant influences. Egyptian sculptors created the first life-sized statues and fine reliefs in stone, copper, and wood. They perfected the art of carving intricate relief decoration and produced detailed images of animals, plants, and even landscapes, recording the essential elements of their world for eternity in scenes painted and carved on the walls of temples and tombs. Kings used reliefs to record victories in battle, royal decrees, and religious scenes, and sculptures of kings, goddesses, and gods were common as well. Sculptures from the Old Kingdom are characteristically more natural in style than their predecessors. Toward the end of the Old Kingdom, images of people shifted toward formalized nude figures with long bodies and large eyes. The Great Sphinx, located among the pyramids of Giza, is the largest monolith statue in the world, standing 241 feet long, 63 feet wide, and 66.34 feet high. Carved out of limestone, it represents a mythical creature known as a sphinx, with a lion's body and a human head. It is commonly believed that the head of the Great Sphinx is that of the 4th dynasty 2680-2565 BCE, Pharaoh Khafre, whose pyramid stands directly behind the giant sculpture. While most sculptures were made of stone, wood was sometimes used as a cheap and easily carved substitute. Paints were obtained from minerals such as iron ores, red and yellow ochres, copper ores, blue and green, soot or charcoal, black, and limestone white. Paints could be mixed with gum arabic as a binder and pressed into cakes, which could be moistened with water when needed. By the 4th dynasty, the idea of the Ka statue was firmly established. Typically made of wood or stone, these statues were placed in tombs as a resting place for the Ka, or spirit, of the person after death. Other sculptural works served as funerary art, accompanying the deceased in burial tombs with the intention of preserving life after death. Strict conventions that changed very little over the course of Egyptian history were intended to convey the timeless and non-aging quality of the figure's car. Very strict conventions governed the crafting of deity figures, and these rules were followed so strictly that over 3,000 years, the appearance of statues changed very little. For example, the sky god Horus was to be represented with a falcon's head, while the god of funeral rites Anubis was to be always shown with a jackal's head. In addition to funerary art, Egyptians surrounded themselves with objects to enhance their lives in this world, producing cosmetic vessels and finely carved and inlaid furniture. Over time, Egyptian artists adopted a limited repertoire of standard types and established a formal artistic canon that would define Egyptian art for more than 3,000 years while remaining flexible enough to allow for subtle variation and innovation. Thank you, hope you find the content informative. Kindly share the video and subscribe to the channel, do comment to let us know what are the other subjects you'd like us to cover.